Thank you very much for the nice introduction, President, and thank you to the Society as well for inviting me to speak tonight. Good evening, fellows, guests, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all tonight to what I hope will be an enjoyable journey through the land of Brochs. Can you all hear me okay at this level? Is my voice carrying okay? okay. Yes. Well, to an audience like tonight's, I think Brochs do not need a formal introduction. Many of you will have read about Brochs or visited the best preserved ones like Musa here or the pair in Glen Elk, those towers of the north, as Ian Armit has called them. <coughs> Brochs are unique to Scotland, but not that unique within Scotland, as there are over 500 of them. Although they concentrate in the north and west, the Atlantic fringes of the country, there are a handful south of the Grampians as well, the so-called lowland Brochs. And the impressive height of Musa here makes it clear why the question almost naturally arises. Why did the people living in Scotland in the Iron Age build such impressive structures and clearly expended so much material and labor on them? Well, this is still a point of discussion and many of you will be aware of the different interpretations and the disagreement about the construction, the function, the use of rocks and also about the exact periods of time when they were constructed, lived in, and abandoned. This quest of the origin of Brochs is nothing new to keep us occupied. James Ferguson identified this as one of the most disputed but most interesting questions of Scottish archaeology, here in his paper in 1878, actually in our society's proceedings. Ferguson was referring to his dispute with, Robert, uh, with Joseph Anderson, the keeper of the Societies of Antiquities at the time. Anderson advocated a Pictish or earlier origin, also in our proceedings, rather than Ferguson, um, who emphasized a Viking connection. Anderson proved to be right in the end, and his early assessment of the architectural achievement of Brochs still rings true today admiring their boldness of conception and fertility of resource. It is this boldness of conception and fertility of resource that fascinates me from an architect's perspective. And my own quest has been to understand what decisions Iron Age builders had to make to arrive at a broch, what resources they needed in materials skills and general labor. And I was interested in how results from analyzing the architecture of Brochs would help us to understand a bit more about the how, but also the why Brochs were built. Thus, what does an architectural analysis add to the archaeological debate about Brochs? Having now studied Brochs for 10 years, I only realized this when I was putting this lecture together that it's been that long, even after 10 years, I still have more questions than answers. But one aspect I'm fairly convinced of, and as I would like to demonstrate tonight, is that from an architectural point of view, brochs are part of the wider British roundhouse tradition, literally a fortification in stone of a much older design concept. The origin of this idea is not mine, but archaeology has only recently started to regard brochs as part of a wider roundhouse building tradition. Previously, the most elaborate dry stone towers had been separated out as brochs and had been studied more or less in isolation. This separation, in particular of the so-called broch towers, placed an emphasis on a defensive function rather than a domestic character. In the 1990s, this view changed and a new term was proposed, the Atlantic Roundhouse. This terminology reflects the changes in the archaeological approach to view all circular or subcircular dry stone buildings as roundhouses built by the people in the north 
that would have built timber roundhouses or crannogs in the more wooded areas of Scotland. And Yun Mackay has produced a corpus of all these substantial stonewalled roundhouses, which is an invaluable research resource. And in due course, our view of timber roundhouses has changed as well. Although these are still studied excluding the broths, we have started to reconstruct the ones with substantial diameters of 15 to 20 meters to a monumentality that is comparable with the broths, as Alan Bravey's reconstruction shows here very well. And let's not forget the wheelhouses, another roundhouse type that is unique to Scotland, with their elegant construction of the thin piers and the peripheral bays they create. They a very elaborate in structural design, although they have a relatively inconspicuous external elevation. Thus, these archaeological similarities, the idea of the substantial house as the home of the household, the extended family, the overall similarities and the quality of the material culture, mundane as well as luxurious goods, these similarities can also be demonstrated architecturally. We can detect similarities in the design, in the layout, and construction of the different roundhouse types. The most obvious is, of course, the circular or roughly circular plan, and the arrangement of internal structural features which divide the interior, creating central and peripheral spaces. With broths, this is achieved by creating intramural spaces. As we can see here, the passages and the cells built in the thick wall and arranged around a central space. Within wheelhouses, the internal dry stone piers are arranged radially, like the spoke of a wheel, hence the name. These piers create the bays on the periphery, again, around a central space. For the timber roundhouses, it is the ring of posts that we can see here, that separates the central area and divides an annular space, often showing a penannular wear pattern, as here, the so-called ring ditch. And the central space forms the focus under the apex of the roof. There are also structural similarities between the different house types. Although they were constructed with different materials, and in different construction methods. The typical Broch construction is the double wall, best seen here in the photograph. The inner wall supports the roof and the outer wall aerodynamically shaped against high wind loads. With wheelhouses, the inner wall of the Broch is reduced to piers and the outer wall is built against earth pressure for the semi-subterranean structures or against the outer wall, just much lower than for the brochs. The internal post ring carries the roof for the timber roundhouses, <laughs> similar perhaps to the wheelhouse piers. Its outer wall is generally insubstantial, non-load bearing. And by structural comparison, it becomes clear that the different roundhouse types all share a structural principle. The main load-bearing elements have been placed inside the house. In this way, they are protected from severe weather conditions, from rot, but also from attack. There's also a practical <coughs> reason to consider brochs as part of the roundhouse group and not to isolate the broch tower. This reason is the actual preservation in the field. We are able to identify Dan Calloway as an architecturally complex Broch Tower because it preserves certain architectural details, such as the typical double wall construction, here also shown in the center. There's also the scarcement, a ledge protruding from the inner wall face, interpreted as supporting upper floors, or the so-called voids, a row of vertical openings 
perhaps to reduce the weight above the door lintel. But we are only able to identify Dun Calloway as a Broch Tower because of one part of the building. All these details are lost in the low part of the Broch Tower. Would we still recognize Dun Calloway as a Broch Tower if it had lost its tall part of the wall? Well, this is sadly the reality for the majority of Brochs. Most of them are more like the low part of Dun Calloway, not the tall part. Thus, in reality, we have to revert to identification such as possible broch or probable broch in order to assess their architectural complexity or simply admit that time has been against us and that we will never be able to tell. Therefore, the integrating and less separating term Atlantic Roundhouse should really be preferred. But let's be honest. In the end, we will always call them brochs. I would argue we simply have to be a bit more flexible as to what this term includes. And to regard brochs as part of the wider ranchers' pedigree has several archaeological implications. We no longer isolate out the complex tower as something alien within the Scottish Iron Age something that may require explanations of new people arriving in Scotland and bringing with them a new form of architecture. The Broch of Scotland is a unique Scottish phenomenon and it can be demonstrated to have developed from within Scotland, from the evidence of earlier stonewalled roundhouses. I'm showing three ground plans here. Two of structures that we would normally call a broch, and one plan of a structure that has been called a massive walled stone round house or a protobroch. Which one is which? Which ones are the well-built, neat and presumably tall broch towers, and which one is the rather jerry-built, not quite there structure? Well, help is at hand. Architectural analysis can tell but this requires investigating the wall construction. The more complex structures, the Broch Towers, can be identified by a solid wall construction, as here, the Broch of Borwick. You can see the stones are well layered throughout the thickness of the wall. A sound construction to build a tall dry stone tower on top. The one below shows the section of the so-called protobroch with what I would call a composite construction of two wall faces, inner and outer, and an uncompacted core consisting of stones, rubble, but also some soil and perhaps working debris. As this section drawing reveals, this has not been a very successful construction in particular when trying to construct a tall building. And the people living in this house at Boo in Orkney had to modify the construction by buttressing the slumping and failing wall faces. The section of the wall that reveals the wall construction is the best indicator whether the structure was a fully fledged tall broch tower or a less well-built lower stone roundhouse. And this detail can be preserved already in a low ring of masonry, not necessarily depending on tall walls to survive. The radiocarbon dates for Boo dated to the 8th century BC. The well-built, more complex structures seem to be later, appearing from about the 4th century BC. This indicates that we may possibly see a development in construction method. Well, if only we could cross-section all thick-walled dry stone roundhouses and obtain dates for their construction, we would perhaps be able to trace the details of this structural development, the trial and errors involved in this intuitive experimental process. So far, we only have glimpses from sites like Boo or Old Skadness or Crossgurg. Well, of course, we cannot cross-section all brochs and protobrochs but projects such as the Caseness Early Architecture, recently introduced by Dr. Andrew Heald, should hopefully provide us with some more insight. 
Ultimately, though, our hands might be tied by the problems of radiocarbon dating and also by the fact that developments are never linear and logical and that this process lasted over several centuries with steps forwards and step backwards. However, it seems that architectural analysis may be able to answer at least a few questions regarding the complexity of construction and therefore help to identify more complex structures from simpler ones. <coughs> but the sample looked at here concentrated on the best preserved structures as recorded for the regions in the north and west that we typically associate with Brochs and the Atlantic culture. Circular dry stone architecture is though not restricted to the Atlantic fringes and the map I show here is only true as far as we've investigated structures so far. So far and as far as I know we have not identified a dry stone roundhouse with complex architectural details such as the double wall construction or intramural cells and galleries in the eastern highlands or along certain parts of the west coast in this area here. Perhaps though, it is only a matter of time until this map will become outdated. A review of roundhouse architecture is underway for this blank area here as part of Murray Cook's project of reviewing the later prehistory of the Northeast and perhaps this may change the distribution. At the moment we're still gathering data but who knows what we will find. Who knows what complex architectural details might be hiding under the rubble? Here, a structure near Avi Moor, not Skye or in Sutherland, as one might suspect at first glance. This combines with new discoveries in Perthshire, such as Castle Craig, discovered through the Royal Fortiviate project by the University of Glasgow, and the Black Spout, as excavated and I understand about to be published by David Strachan. A second, analytical look might change our picture and our definition of Brochs yet again. And what, from what we know so far, it is not being conformity, but variation between the structures that was one of the striking outcomes of my architectural analysis, even between those structures that are no doubt Broch towers, with all their architectural complexity. My results confirm that not all are like Musa, even in Shetland. Here, Clevigard surviving as a grassed over mound, something that Noel Fouyut has suspected already a long time ago. The first difference <coughs> that meets the eye is that Brochs occupy so many different landscape positions. The solitaire on the rocky outcrop or on a steep, craggy knoll. The Broch that consumes the entire expand of a small island within a loch with only a causeway connecting it to the land. Or the ones on the dramatic clifftop locations along the shores, looking out to sea and be seen. Then there are the tall towers that form the centre of a surrounding settlement. The many different locations lead to the question why a particular stretch of land was occupied. For example, Gurness might have controlled the Einhalo Sound, but the surrounding land was also good for growing crop or tending pastures, and could be improved to maximize the yield of the harvest as Dockrell demonstrated at Old Skadness. What <coughs> about the brochs that were deliberately built away from the fertile lands in the marginal zone? between the Fertile Macher and the box of the Hinterland, and as argued by Parker Pearson and Charpoles. Where did the inhabitants of these brochs, so common in the Western Isles, grew their crop and tended their stock? But questions that need to be answered by archaeology. But one aspect that most of these different settings have in common architecturally is that they are all built on bedrock. The majority of brochs locations 76% were chosen wisely for such a heavy construction. The bedrock location all had another advantage. They provide easy access to building stones, for example as this shore location 
the Arcadian flagstone can literally be picked up from the beach. On-site quarrying would also have allowed for shaping the natural topography of the site. Here, at Hoganes on Anst, the building stone was most likely acquired from quarrying the ditches. Difficult to decide about cause and effect, but analogies can be found at medieval castles. The rock cut ditches suggest assessing other sites with a similar question in mind, such as Denmark in Sutherland or the hillock sites on Skye. Is this simply frost shatter, or could one argue that the rock faces of the cliffs and hillocks that these brochs were built upon have been quarried? The effect would be a steepening of the cliff edge to almost vertical faces in some occasions, with which, similar to the ditches at Hoganes, would have enhanced the defensibility of the site. It certainly made the broch on top look much more impressive, as it seems almost to merge with the cliff face below, as seen here at Dan Sullerdale on Sky. It seems that some sites were deliberately enhanced to impress, to convey a defensive function, perhaps to lay an invincible claim to the land they stand on. How practical the defence impression really was remains to be demonstrated and really depends on the nature of Aramid warfare. Perhaps other motifs were also at work during the design process. In particular, Orkney and also in Case Ness, Brochs seek deliberate reference to earlier sites as so well documented at the How in Orkney excavated by Beverly Bell and Smith. This phenomenon has been interpreted by Hingley and recently by Sharples as a deliberate redevelopment to give the Iron Age inhabitants control over access to the bones of the ancestors and establish themselves as the intermediary between the present and the past to safeguard the fertile lands. However, the same evidence could be interpreted differently. The literal replacement of Neolithic tombs with Iron Age roundhouses could also represent a process of transformation or even destruction. Evidence at how suggests that the centre of the Neolithic cairn was deliberately destroyed before the new broch was erected on top of it. The redevelopment of a previously untouched monument could mean that the original importance of the site had been forgotten or lost its significance. It might have even stronger implications that previous legacies or powers had lost their taboo and were now visually superseded by new structures, socially as well as architecturally. Were Broxton built as deliberate statements in and upon an earlier landscape, a visual and physical manifestation of a potent household and their impressive new home. This leads to the question how tall a broch would have needed to be in its particular setting to become a prominent marker. Would have building heights reacted to the surrounding landscape? What does monumentality mean for each structure? Here at Danvaravat, I have reconstructed it with a five meter tall wall. This is nothing compared to the 30 meters surviving at Musa, but within its setting, I would argue this reconstruction conveys a sense of dominance and perhaps monumentality, even at this relatively low height. And my calculations of possible heights suggest that a much higher wall would have not been advisable for this structure. In comparison, Eden's Hall sits on a wide open <coughs> plateau. The reconstruction here shows it at seven meters wall height, but because of its large diameter, the height comparable with Dunbaravat creates a completely different geometry for the external elevation. Here are the two structures compared together at roughly similar wall height, but in very different landscape settings. In order to reach proportionally comparable appearance, and in order to dominate its landscape setting, we would expect a wall height nearing 17 meter for the large dimensions of Eden's Hall. And the thick walls of the borders example would have seemingly supported this. 
It is thus important to remember when we talk about monumentality and possible heights of Brochs to consider these structures within the landscape and to remember their variable dimensions. It seems that dimensions were adapted to the surrounding topography and therefore a small structure like Danvaralat can still achieve a prominence within its setting. The variation in Broch design can also be seen in the different stone materials used for their construction. The hard granite here at Kulswick in Shetland or the gneiss of the Western Isles and the basalt on Skye have high compression strengths and could therefore make more load, therefore take more load per cubic meter compared to softer sandstones. This means thicker walls for a sandstone broch if it is to achieve a similar structural soundness. This relationship between stone material and wall dimension might explain the variation in wall thickness between brochs in different regions. The wall thickness corresponds with the compression strengths of the specific stone material. We can see this here on the example of three sites from different regions. The wall thickness of East Broch of Burray, built in sandstone, is about 4.4 meter, and the average on Orkney is 4.6 meter. Compared to this, Dantokwil on North Uist, built in Nice, has particularly thin walls, on average 3.2 meters only, and walls in the Western Isles are generally thinner, on average 3.7 meter. This is one meter thinner than walls in Orkney. And the wall dimension of the gneiss compared with the thin basalt walls on sky as well. This is not a coincidence between individual structures, but a part that can be recognized across the regions. The wall thickness seems adjusted to the properties of the local stone. Such structural design can only be undertaken if the builder understands the properties of the local stone which means knows the stone and its structural potential. A strong argument that brochs were built by local people that had gained their skills and experience by using the local material over a long time. There's another conclusion in this aspect. If they were building thinner walls with better stones, why did they not simply build thicker walls with the better stones? This would have allowed them to build higher would it not have been an aim to build the tallest rock? Well, apparently not. The evidence suggests that there might have been a structural optimum with regards to heights. Most brochs could have easily reached 8 to 10, if not 15 meters, but there was seemingly no attempt to build much taller than this, even with the better stones. I assume this is I assume this because they are not increasing but decreasing the wall thickness with the better stone. Well, perhaps a technical issue. This means that we cannot per se imply a direct competition between rock builders of who built the tallest rock. They could have been built to all, all to comparable height, just some with less effort and expenditure of material. The different locally available stone has another effect on the appearance of brochs, not just the dimensions, but the characters of the stones create different masonry patterns. The laminating sandstones, breaking into long flat stones, create a neat, well coursed masonry pattern. This can also be achieved in schist, although to a lesser extent. The intractable gneiss and granites in the glassy basalt naturally break more into rougher blocks than slabs and as a consequence creates what we may regard as a less regular masonry pattern. But it seems that we are applying a modern perspective influenced by machine cut ashlar masonry if we discern well-built sandstone structures and jerry-built gneiss. It seems that the difference is simply a reflection of the properties of the stone and the ability to work this stone with Iron Age tools. The good structural properties of the harder to work stones demonstrate that stability was not an issue. I would argue that the different stones creating different masonry patterns might have created something of a local preference. 
I draw this conclusion from unusual examples, such as the sandstones at Clartol, which used large, rough blocks, more like the gneiss or basalt. There is a particularly hard sandstone in the area, but this block also looks out to sky and the Western Isles and may reflect aesthetical influences from there. The nice at Dantrodden has been used to create a laminated appearance, more like sandstone blocks. But because of the nice at Dantrodden and also at Dantelf nearby, this would have meant a particular effort to quarry, select and dress the right stone. Was this effort undertaken to imitate a certain appearance? But the general trend seems to be that the majority of regional masonry patterns reflect the properties of the local stone and perhaps created a locally preferred aesthetics, even if the particular stone source locally is not directly suited for it. Other examples are seemingly seeking reference elsewhere and overcome the restriction of the material. A certain design is deliberately wanted <coughs> and achieved. Thus, it seems brochs are not adhering to a certain blueprint, a standard set of dimensions, <coughs> materials and locations, but react to the local topography and react to locally available materials. But there's also room for expressing individual ideas, preferences or design ambitions. This is something I would argue is particularly obvious in the layout of the plans which in turn is directly related to the function of the house. In the layout of the plan, we see preferred spatial arrangements adjusted to individual needs. Analysis of plans and the area of internal space that these provide yielded a similar result of certain regional preferences and again, no standard blueprints. Brochs and Orkney, such as East Broch of Burray, provide a large central area. Spaces within the walls are few and are usually confined cells. This may relate again to the stone material as the sandstone requires thicker walls that are best built solidly with few interventions. The area provided here by central and peripheral spaces totals to about 100 square meter. A different spatial pattern is provided by the nice or basalt built rocks such as Dantorkel or Dunfiathard. Here, a much smaller central area provides as little as 72 square meter. However, the overall total of central and peripheral space is not far off the Orkney example. Two aspects are interesting here, and these proved true for the analysis of all included structures. It seems that each broch is designed to create a certain minimum of internal space, which ranges between 100 and 130 square meters, the typical size of a modern bungalow. The difference is in how this space is created, either by a large central area or by providing space within the thickness of the walls, space that is a very different character to the spacious central area. This space can be a compact, almost circular cell with a tall roof or a narrow, elongated gallery that continues around the circumference. Both intramural spaces provide different spatial options. And it seems that Broch inhabitants require different spatial layouts. And the Broch, Broch plan was flexible enough to address these different needs. But despite the individual arrangement of internal space, there are again regional similarities, plan patterns. In each region, here for example Orkney, certain layouts are preferred. Although individual arrangement and sizes vary, the location of the entrance to the intramural space is placed in the same position in relation to the main entrance. The main entrance here and the entrance to the intramural space. In Orkney, this arrangement seemed to ensure that the space in the centre is kept relatively free and the space to access the intramural spaces from the main entrance is kept to a minimum. 
leaving the maximum space free in the center, well, enough to swing a cat. In comparison, in the Western Isles, we recognize a series of plants that contain a high number of peripheral entrances to intramural spaces. Such arrangements require the central area to be relatively free in order to access all these different spaces. Again, regionally typically layout, typical layout seems to be preferred, perhaps reflecting earlier, older spatial arrangements, which mean that the way a house is traditionally used has not changed through the ages. However, variation of this tradition is obvious. Not two examples are exactly the same. Or are there? But within this variety, it is striking to see a handful of plan layers that are arrestingly similar, almost as pairs, or twins, as I like to call them. Were these similar, but not quite identical structures built at the same time by the same people? Or did they draw inspiration from an earlier abandoned rock nearby? <coughs> Occasional parallels also occur across regions, possibly suggesting close contacts between communities living in different parts of Scotland. Many such comparable structures are concentrated <coughs> along the eastern and western coastlines, hinting at system of maritime contact and exchange, perhaps reinforced by marriage or fosterage. Such links across regions may have also played a part in providing for the lost building parts, the timber for roof and possible upper floors. In the treeless regions of the Western Isles or Shetland, such contacts with perhaps more tree-rich regions such as parts of Sutherland or Argyll may have been essential. Or woodland would have had to be locally managed, presumably not yielding substantial trunks, but trees with much smaller dimensions. As for the local stone and its particular properties, we may have to assume that the architecture was adjusted to the availability of timber sizes as well. We simply cannot tell since these building parts have not survived. We have thus seen that Broch design was adjusted to the locally available materials. And because of this, we can assume that they must have been built by local people who knew the properties of the stone and the strengths of the available timber. They knew the best place to build a tall structure to see and be seen, and whether this site would provide suitable building material. They were able to design a layout that would reflect the way the house needed to be used. Enough space for all the goods and chattels, for everybody to sleep, eat and be merry, and to keep the dogs away from the bacon. Iron Age Brock builders would have had to be as familiar with the local materials and as inventive and flexible with them as the people living in the same rural areas in later periods, the people who built Scotland's regionally varied vernacular record. The crack construction is a good example of how relatively sizable spans could be achieved by creating multi-membered trusses. Evidence from case Ness here shows up to seven members making up one truss. The vernacular evidence also holds plentiful information with regards to the building parts we have lost for the bros, and the record shows how much locally available materials shape the individual appearance of houses, creating a characteristic style between houses of different regions, which may in plan, or from archaeological evidence, look very <coughs> similar. This regionally specific record, similarly adapted to the locally available materials, can for the Broch provide analogies for the reconstruction of the lost building parts. Thus, I would argue that our reconstructions should be intended to reflect the regionality detected in the record and the variation in construction and design that architectural analysis was able to demonstrate. Reconstructing in alternatives 
rather than suggesting only one fit-all solution, will make us realize that the Iron Age reality probably laid somewhere in between the extremes of Musa and Danvaravad. Alternative proposals should stop us from accepting stereotypical reconstructions and make us more aware of the speculative nature of our reconstructions. It allows us to play with ideas. What if the circular plan was roofed with a ridged roof rather than the typical cone on cylinder? And by using results from analysis and analogy with the vernacular record, we can highlight patterns of regional identity that seems to be inherent in Broch design. Thus, Don Torquil on wet and windswept North Eust is reconstructed with a low wall, only six meter. Its low roof is set back from the eaves to form a protective parapet against wind uplift, as seen in the vernacular evidence. And because the vernacular record of sky is different from the more exposed Western Isles, then Fiat out here has been reconstructed with a higher roof and the typical overhanging eaves. Thus, we arrive at a vision of the possible diversity of Brochland. There would have been tall structures dominating the coastline, lonely markers along the shore small structures with pointed roofs and small-scale framed settings, or large but low broths with a very different appearance, part of a different settlement type. We can recognize similarities, the same architectural language, the same pedigree, a relatively coherent design from afar. But from what is preserved, we have to assume that there is no standard broch, no blueprint. And by allowing for diversity, we are allowing for individual expression, individual decision, and we are getting a glimpse of a personal prehistory. Thus, to summarize the findings from the architectural analysis, we have recognized overall similarities, not just within the Broch group, but with wheelhouses and timber roundhouses as well. The circular plan, the general layout, the similar structural principle of placing the main load-bearing members inside the house for protection. We have seen the similarities within the Broch group, the prominence in the landscape, the conveying of a defensive character, the shared details, and the adjustment of structural dimensions to the available materials, stone and wood. But we've also noticed a strong regional influence the preference of certain topographical locations in different regions, the influence of the local stone onto the structural design of the broch. We have recognized regionally distinctive plan layouts. Thus regional trends and local traditions prevail, but structures adjusted to and embedded within their environment and the community, confirming local identities. This proved that the overall architectural language of the Broch can easily be adapted to a local tradition that seems to be much older than the Broch idea. This variation, much more than previously anticipated, also reflects individual preferences, individual design decisions. In these unique details, in the variation, we can see the very deliberate choice to conform or to differ with regional or general objectives. This becomes most obvious in the variation of the house plans and the different uses of the internal space. Throughout the Iron Age, a period of a thousand years from the 8th century BC, Broch construction would surely have seen changes as a result of changing social and economic circumstances. The variation reflects individual, individual expression through display architecture, evolving during the later first millennium BC from personal experience and experiments passed down through generations. Rock construction had seemingly become the main medium for social, political, economic and symbolic expression. 
The process of building a broch, gathering the materials, the stone, the timber, and the people to build it, created an impressive icon that presented a cultural coherence from afar. All this comes together to create an identity, locally, regionally, and Scotland-wide, something as old and as new as it could be at the time. A statement of tradition, ambition, contacts, potential, individuality, and belonging on very different levels, a truly architectural design. Thank you very much.